Well, I, I thought it was important to, to try to provide information that patients could assimilate, but also that, that doctors may find interesting. The, this particular sign, I, I've only encountered it a few times in practice. And while we do teach about the redundant nerve sign, it, it's not something that comes up very often. But when it does, boy, it's, it's really something to see. And the imaging was, it was so dramatic. I, I really didn't feel like I, I wanted to treat her, but she really wanted to go along with it. And she's such a pleasant individual. It's been such a, a great pleasure to work with her. This is the Back Doctors Podcast, enlightening conversations with doctors from around the world, sharing patient stories and treatment strategies to reduce pain and increase quality of life. For those suffering with spine-related conditions, you'll hear their struggles and successes as they inform, educate, and offer hope for the millions of people who have back pain. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Johnson. Welcome to this episode of the Back Doctors Podcast. Our spine specialist today is Dr. Dean Greenwood. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Greenwood. Thank you very much. Well, we've had a little bit of a chat before we recorded. I know you have an interesting case for our listeners today. So if you want to go ahead and begin the story. Yeah, this was a particularly interesting case, a, a case that I almost didn't treat. Um, she presented in such a severe state that uh, I wasn't sure that our care would be appropriate for her. But I'll, I'll just go through the, the background of the case briefly. Uh, last September, a 72-year-old female patient consulted me with a long-standing history of low back pain and bilateral leg pain all the way down to her calf. And she was progressively worsening over about a year. And she had developed a forward flexed posture of about 30 degrees. So when she tried to stand up, she couldn't stand up straight. Her, her body was actually listed forward uh, almost to 30 degrees. And this was actually getting worse. This forward position did give her some relief, uh, but if she tried to straighten herself up, her pain became so severe she couldn't tolerate it. She described the pain as severe. She was not able to straighten her spine, and she'd been told by her medical physician that she was suffering from lumbar spinal stenosis, and this had been identified by medical imaging. But all the attempts of the medical doctor to bring her relief were unsuccessful. As long as she walked stooped forward, she could tolerate short distances, but her pain was relentless. It was daily, and she described it as a 10 out of 10, extended all the way down, particularly to her left calf, but she also had pain in the right upper thigh area. She had no history of trauma. She had not been in any accidents. She was not an athletic individual. Uh, she had no other diseases, nor did she have family history. But she did mention to me that she had worked for several decades before retiring, and she was a librarian. She sat most of the time, and that was pretty much her main occupational activity. Now, lumbar spinal stenosis is a very common condition. We treat this on a daily basis and now in our practice. It's a narrowing of the spinal canal, and it compresses the nerves traveling through the lower back into the legs. And while it may affect younger patients due to developmental causes, in other words, if the spinal canal develops too narrow, then younger people, I've seen people in their 40s with lumbar spinal stenosis, uh, they, they can develop this. But it, it is more often a degenerative condition that affects people who are typically over the age of 60. Now, in 2010, a prominent spine surgeon and researcher, Dr. Richard Dayo, observed that spinal surgery, particularly for lumbar stenosis, is one of the fastest growing procedures in the United States. However, as patients age and develop other comorbidities, in other words, other diseases like diabetes, osteoporosis, uh, kidney problems, et cetera, surgery becomes a less viable option due to the possibility of risks, complications, and these people often don't benefit as well Either the surgery is too minimal, they, we hear the term minimally invasive surgery, uh, and so they get almost no relief, or they have short-lived relief that requires reoperation, or the procedure is so extensive involving a resection of segments of the spine called a laminectomy, fusion with metal rods, and, and often older people don't tolerate this procedure well. Our patient was only willing to consider surgery as a last resort. And here in Canada, spinal surgery 
is 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 quite a con- it's not done frequently. Um, we do have patients that have had spinal surgery, but training with Dr. Cox and my colleagues in the states, we, we hear way more cases of spinal surgery in the United States. Of course, our medical system is a little bit different, and there are great delays in imaging and surgical referrals in Canada. This is kind of a good thing for chiropractors in Canada because there's a lot of people that are are walking around that actually may need surgery, but are not able to uh, access it. She noticed our sidewalk sandwich board one day, which advertises our specialty in Cox spinal decompression for the treatment of several conditions. And one of which is spinal stenosis. We actually have this on our little advertisement board on the sidewalk. She decided to book a consultation with me. And she provided me with a series of imaging reports, which showed a history of lower back pain dating back to 2010. Bone density testing indicated osteoporosis. This is a demineralization of the spine common in postmenopausal women. CT scans demonstrated an anterolisthesis, which is a forward slipping of a vertebra, usually associated with degeneration of the spinal discs and joints, and is much more common in women, according to the research. Along with these findings were multiple disc herniations and severe spinal canal narrowing, which is stenosis. Her most recent imaging results were from a November 2019 MRI, and it showed severe degenerative changes in the thoracic and lumbar spine with severe spinal canal narrowing, especially at L3-4, just midway down the lumbar spine. In this report, the radiologist described redundancy of the cauda equina nerve roots superior to the L3-4 level. Now, the cauda equina is a term used to describe the bundle of nerves which arise from the bottom of the spinal cord and pass through the lumbar spine, giving rise to nerves which supply the pelvis and legs. This particular description of redundancy was most troubling to me, and this is rarely reported on MR imaging. I decided to obtain the images to view them myself before I would offer to treat her. Her long-standing progressive condition may have reached the point of no return and I was reluctant to offer treatment to her unless I could be reasonably certain that she would be a good candidate for care. Now, Dr. Johnson, if I may, I would like to digress for just a moment to discuss the redundant nerve root sign to highlight the severity of this case. I found a journal the World Journal of Radiology, and this was 2021. This is very recent. And these doctors at the University of Tokat in Turkey uh, described the redundant nerve roots as the, of the cauda equina as a natural evolutionary part of lumbar spinal canal stenosis. And this is secondary to the degenerative processes. It's characterized by elongated, enlarged, and tortuous or twisted nerve roots superior or inferior to the stenotic segment. Now this term redundant nerve roots of the cauda equina was first used by doctors Cressman and Paul in 1968. And their paper was titled serpentine myelographic defect caused by a redundant nerve root. Serpentine of course, meaning snake-like. They used a myelographic dye within the spine. And with the x-rays that were available in the 1960s, we're able to see these changes of the spinal nerves and termed it the redundant nerve root. Magnetic resonance imaging findings have been defined more frequently in recent years, but the condition has been relatively under-recognized in radiologic practice. So we don't see this often on MR uh, examinations. Uh, The radiologist just doesn't seem to describe it, or it's not evident. This is a a very severe case of spinal stenosis. The redundancy is probably a pathological consequence of chronic pressure force at the spinal canal stenosis zone level. Basic pathological findings in patients with redundancy of the cauda equina are demyelination, which is also seen in multiple sclerosis damage to and reduction in the number of nerve fibers, and endoneural fibrosis or scarring, which may cause permanent damage to the nerves. And of course, this leads to severe pain, 
and loss of function in the muscles and organs associated with these nerves. So you can see this is a potentially very serious and progressive situation. Our patient appreciated my concern and agreed to wait until the images arrived. About a month after our first meeting, she returned to my office and her condition was basically unchanged. I told her there was a 50-50 chance that I may be able to provide her with some relief, but she, she may ultimately require surgery and, and she acknowledged that. Her recommended treatment program was three times a week for three weeks to determine if she would even respond favorably to care. Many of these stenosis patients do not get any benefit from the first few weeks of treatment, but if they are willing to go along with the program, many will find relief as time goes on. Our initial goal always is to achieve a 50% reduction of symptoms, at which time the treatment may be continued, but at a reduced frequency if the patient so chooses. At first, she was not able to lay on the Cox adjusting instrument in a prone or face down position. This is the most typical position that we use for our technique. We teach our certified doctors to modify the Cox technique and use a side-lying position instead of a prone position and to perform spinal flexion, distraction, decompression accordingly. So the patient now is on their side and, and with these fabulous Cox tables that, that we use, we're able to deflect the table from side to side, which actually creates a flexion distraction motion within the spine, as opposed to being face down and using the table as we normally see. We gradually progressed to prone positioning after several treatments. So she, she started to acquire more tolerance to the treatment, but we used a pelvic cushion underneath her pelvis to allow her spine to remain in a forward flex posture. So even though she was improving her symptoms, her forward flex posture persisted. Her condition remained unchanged, and her pain was not improved at all for several treatments. But then she started to notice that the pain in her calf had become somewhat less. It was still severe, but it seemed to be different, and it seemed to be progressing up her leg, away from her calf, more into the back of her thigh, into her buttocks, and into her spine. We call this centralization of the symptoms, and this is an indication that the patient is approaching a 50% improvement of her condition. Then within a few weeks, her pain began to slowly improve to about 50% as she described it. And she felt that we were making progress and she was willing to continue. She was more tolerant of the treatment and she could now lay face down without a pelvic cushion. So her spine was gradually straightening out. So when she laid face down and her spine straightened out, it, it was much more tolerable for her. The frequency of treatment was reduced to two times per week and gradually to once per week. She, she insisted that she continue it two times a week because she felt so much better. But I said, you know, the, the protocol suggests that we reduce the frequency of treatment. And, and I thought that she was at a point where she didn't need to come so frequently. As she improved, she was able to stand more upright. And then she began to incorporate uh, appropriate back strengthening exercises, which she tolerated well and did every day, along with nerve flossing, stretching exercises to uh, mobilize the nerves through the spinal canal and through the openings through which they pass into the legs. She's now only seen once every two weeks. Uh, I know she'd like to go back to weekly, but she's so much better. I, I feel it's appropriate to keep her at two weeks she continues to sense that her condition is improving, which is really good news. And I just saw this patient last week and I told her about our podcast. She was very excited. She reports that she is at least 80% recovered in just under five months. And she's had no relapses of the calf pain. She described how surprised her friends were at her improvement. And she's become an ambassador for our work, referring several patients to me for care, most of whom are over 70 and most of whom have spinal stenosis. What an amazing story for her to be forward flexed and to be able to start walking upright in just five months and you know, with this serious condition that she had in her spine. Well, I'm sure some listeners are wondering a little bit more about what Cox technique is and how it's used and what other things can be treated with Cox technique. 
So can you share us a little bit more about the Cox Technique uh, protocol and, and how you use it in your office? Absolutely. Cox Technique is a, a gentle form of chiropractic manipulation, and it uses a specialized instrument developed and designed by Dr. James Cox. The, the treatment involves a decompression of the spinal segment and then a movement of the spinal segments, much like an adjustment, but it's done with a very low, um, low force and it's done very, very slowly. The importance of this type of condition as compared to some other chiropractic techniques is that for a patient such as the one we've just described, it's very well tolerated. You, you can sense if a patient is going to get into trouble with the technique. You, you, you move it so slowly, you find the areas of tolerance and you gradually decompress the spine. Of course, in a case of stenosis or degenerative disc or spinal osteoarthritis, there is a gradual breakdown of the cartilage between the vertebral segments, which causes the vertebrae to approximate or come too close to each other. And in, in so doing, this causes a narrowing, not only of the spinal canal, which is the central canal through which the cauda equina passes, but also the lateral canals through which each individual nerve passes and then goes into the pelvis and lower legs. So we treat degenerative disc disease. We treat uh, compression fractures that, that are they're not requiring any type of surgical intervention. We, we treat younger people with scoliosis. I, I treat a great number of people with scoliosis and I've had a lot of success, not necessarily in straightening their spine back to normal, but in, in alleviating much of the pain that's associated with the progression of spinal scoliosis. So, and, and on our, our sign that I mentioned are at the front of our office, we take it in and out uh, to the sidewalk every day. And it actually states these things, uh, spinal disc degeneration, disc herniation, uh, spinal stenosis, scoliosis, uh, spondylosis, which is sort of a, a wear and tear of the spine, which often is associated with age and most of our patients now, I've been in practice now for 40 years, most of our patients are mature patients, and they appreciate the gentle nature of this technique. Well, great explanation. Let's take a listen from your uh, patient as she shares her story. Um, I started experiencing back pain uh, after I retired. I'd retired, I retired. I'm a librarian, and I had a very sedentary job. I sat at a desk for years and years and years. And I retired in 2012 and I started experiencing back pain in 2013. I had about a two week episode of excruciating pain and uh, it lasted about two weeks and it went away. And then I had an x-ray and so I had, I was aware that there was problems with the discs, the disc height. And uh, in 2015, I had progressively worse pain and I had a CT scan and I had a diagnosis, uh, degenerative disc disease. I had a, a CT scan in 2017. 2019, I had an MRI and it, the pain had been progressively worse and worse. By, by that 2019, that fall, I, I couldn't walk anymore. I, the pain on my left leg and the buttocks and the left leg all the way to the, the calf was just excruciating. I, I couldn't walk. I, I just didn't know what to do. So my doctor made an appointment for me with the spine clinic at our local hospital. And I had an assessment then and um, they didn't do anything for me. They just told me that I had this degenerative disc disease and they made an appointment for me with the surgeon and I had a telephone call with the surgeon in May of 2020. And he just put me on a list for a spinal block injection, but uh, really didn't do anything. I, no suggested of treatment. He suggested, uh, what do they call them? Where you work with a specialist and they do exercises with you. Uh, but I didn't do that. I would be, I'd been going to an osteopath since uh, February of 2020, and he gave me exercises to do. So I started doing exercises on a regular basis. But 
I couldn't walk any distance. Um, I had a number of different therapies. I had uh, some acupuncture. I had one PRP injection. Didn't re nothing really seemed to help. Um, about June of 2020, I had an appointment at my um, optometrist and their office was quite close to Dr. Greenwood's office. And I noticed the sign on the back of Dr. Greenwood's um, office window saying Vancouver Spine Center. And I thought, well, wow, what's this? So after my appointment at the um, optometrist, I went around the front. Their office was already closed, but I saw they had a little sandwich board out front and they said specialized in spinal stenosis. So I, unfortunately, I had already made a commitment to go up to the interior of British Columbia for the summer. I've been doing that for many years. Um, I was still in, in pretty bad pain. I couldn't walk very well at all. I was using uh, walking sticks or, uh, but after the summer, I managed to get through the summer okay. I'd been going more for osteopathic treatments and I continue with my exercises. By September, I returned back to Vancouver and I suddenly got much worse. I couldn't sleep. I could not lie on my back or my stomach with my legs out straight. I had to always be in kind of in a fetal position, both on my side when I slept, tried to sleep. Uh, so I called Dr. Greenwood's office in, uh, in September, and uh, my first assessment with his, him was in early October. And I started treatments with him uh, October 23rd. And uh, it, it was painful at first. The treatments were painful. And I always had to have a bolster under my uh, abdomen because I couldn't lie straight. So by mid to late September, I noticed improvements. I was absolutely amazed. I did not have pain for as long or as frequently. I could start to walk. I started walking for a few blocks at a time. My friends noticed my posture had improved because with the pain, I was quite stooped. And also I was listing to my right side because the pain was all on my left side. And I, I didn't really notice there was some pain in the front of the right thigh, um, but it was certainly wasn't what I was experiencing on my left side. So um, Dr. Greenwood noticed my improvements and I continued. Um, at first I was doing three treatments per week for about three weeks. And then by the fourth week, I was on to two appointments per week. I continued to improve gradually. I could walk around the block by the fifth week, um, I walked several blocks. I continued to do my exercises, which I had been doing. But by the seventh week, my pain was almost gone. I would say it was about 50% gone. Um, I was able to go for longer walks. I could get in and out of my car without the same excruciating pain on my left side. My posture had improved and I was sleeping better because there was a period of time where I had to sit up in bed. I could not lie down in bed without pain. But my pain is, I would say, I, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not over optimistic, but I would say my pain is 90% gone. I still have a little bit on my right side. And from time to time, I get a little pain in my calf, my left calf. Sometimes when I sneeze, when pain was really bad, sneezing was excruciating. But Dr. Greenwood says, don't remember the pain. <laughs> but uh, so I don't, I don't really, but I just remember the type of lifestyle I had was just so limited. And now I, I really feel like I have my life back. I have improved so much. I tell <laughs> all my friends that, about Dr. Greenwood. And I've had several of them make appointments and start treatments with him. So I'm just a good advertisement <laughs> for Dr. Greenman and for the Cox therapy. I think it's, people should know about it. I'm just so grateful that um, I found out about Dr. Greenwood sort of by happenstance, but I just can't be happier than I am today. And 
I'm down to one treatment. I have a treatment this week and, and then I'm down to one per th every three weeks and then we'll be on maintenance after that. So I, I just think it's wonderful. I'm just so happy. It's just made such tremendous difference in my life. Again, great story, Dr. Greenwood. Would you like to share with our listeners a little bit more about yourself and about your practice there? Uh, sure. I, I graduated from Palmer College of Chiropractic in 1981. I, I now practice and have practiced in Vancouver um, the whole time. I, I gradually uh, changed my technique style over the years. Uh, I, I've moved more to the Cox Protocols almost exclusively. And while I do use other techniques and, and modalities, uh, such as you know, low-volt galvanism and laser techniques, the, the mainstay of my practice is the Cox technique. I've had the great fortune of being able to work with Dr. Cox and his colleagues, and I've um, had the pleasure of lecturing to several doctors here in Canada, in the United States, and, and a great opportunity to uh, teach doctors in Switzerland. Uh, so I, I've been very blessed by the relationship with Dr. Cox, and um, I'm very happy to continue to work with him. And can you give our listeners some contact information for you and your office? Sure. So our office is at 1678 West Broadway in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and if anyone would like to contact us, it's the email is mail at vancouverspinecarecenter.com. And I'll remind my friends and colleagues in the United States that we spell center R-E at the end instead of E-R. Uh, we are available for new patients uh, most days, although with pandemic, we have uh, found that we're very, very busy these days. M many physicians are not seeing patients live. They're using these types of Zoom calls to see patients, and patients appreciate the hands-on and the face-to-face -face contact. And We use very safe protocols in our office to mitigate the possibility of spread of the COVID, but uh, We've been probably busier now than we've ever been in our career. So we uh, have a lot of people with spines that need care, and we're there to help them. Well, great. So for our listeners, we'll have Dr. Greenwood's contact information in the show notes, as well as how you can find a Cox certified doctor in your area. Well, Dr. Greenwood, the purpose of the podcast is to bring hope to the millions of people suffering with back pain. And you've certainly done that for us today with all the conditions that you've talked about and this story of great success with this patient that you had. So I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy practice to be with us today on the Back Doctors podcast. Thanks for having me on. Now that you've heard this patient's success story, head on over to the backdoctorspodcast.com to connect with doctors from around the globe who want to help you find a solution for your back pain. Sign up for our newsletter to get the latest news and resources for treating spinal conditions. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Back Doctors Podcast. This episode of the Back Doctors Podcast has been sponsored by Haven Medical, a team of highly skilled engineers who handcraft every Coxade instrument. The Coxade is the only table that is certified by Dr. James Cox to perform all Cox technique protocols because it's been designed and built and based on over 50 years of his pioneering research. No other table performs like a Coxade or allows doctors to treat such a diverse range of conditions, including cases other doctors have given up on. And right now, Haven Medical has a special offer for doctors. If you'd like to get more involved with Cox Technique, Haven Medical is offering our listeners a special unadvertised price on the Cox 8 table. Not only that, but they will also pay to send you to the next postgraduate Cox Technique certification class. If you'd like to learn more and take advantage of this special offer, give Amanda at Haven Medical a call at 616-935-1049 and tell her you heard it on our podcast. That number again is 616-935-1049. Give Haven Medical a call today.